And they're expecting uh, probably thousands of people to jam every nook and cranny that you see in this neighborhood. A papal visit in the heart of Mexico's drug trafficking country. The border town preparing for huge crowds ahead of his historic visit. And on the campaign trail, a new app testing the limits of personal data collection. The questions about how privacy now following it around. Waiting for a wildflower tradition in the desert. The weather changes that may affect the blossoms. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Amitha Sharma. New demands for oversight today for the agency covering development along the California coastline. Assembly Speaker Tony Atkins joined Sacramento lawmakers to pitch a bill that would require anyone lobbying the Coastal Commission to report several details, including who they work for and their pay. The proposal announced today comes a week after commissioners voted behind closed doors to fire Executive Director Charles Lester. California Governor Jerry Brown joins several U.S. governors to bolster clean energy efforts. He and 16 others make up the governor's accord for a new energy future and have agreed to develop clean energy projects that will also boost the economy. Brown signed a climate change law last year aiming to generate half of the state's electricity from renewable sources by 2030. Another bag ban vote on tap tonight. Delmar City leaders are considering banning single-use plastic bags. The San Diego suburb would become the third community in the county to outlaw the use of the thin plastic bags. Encinitas and Solana Beach both outlawed their use at large retailers and grocery stores. Delmar doesn't have those stores, so their legislation focuses on restaurants. Caltrans touted 29 construction projects today that will either start this year or are already underway. Construction work continues in the South Bay on the first of three projects that will make up the State Ride 11. The I-5 Genesee Interchange will see changes this year, including a separate bike and pedestrian path between Sorrento Valley Road and Voigt Drive. And in North County, work is progressing to widen State Route 76 Highway to four lanes from South Mission to Interstate 15. The challenge remains for Caltrans to maintain our existing infrastructure while still managing the needs of a growing region. Caltrans hopes a majority of construction projects from this year will encourage walking and cycling. A packed stadium welcomed Pope Francis today in Morelia, Mexico. The pontiff celebrated mass there in the heart of Mexico's drug trafficking country. His message today to Mexico's priests fight injustice and to stand up to drug-fueled violence and corruption. In less than 24 hours, Pope Francis will become the first pontiff to ever visit Juarez. He will celebrate a mass that will be heard just across the border in El Paso, Texas. From our Fronteras partner, Cronkite News reporter Chloe Nordquist shows us how El Paso is getting ready. Most days, shoppers from Mexico fill South El Paso Street, just a block from the border crossing. But soon, there will be crowds of pilgrims heading into Mexico to see the Pope. On Wednesday, um, most of the shops here are not going to open, since most of the owners are either religious or mostly because of traffic and not a lot of people are going to come. Just a few streets away, the historic neighborhood Segundo Barrio will be completely blocked off. People are so excited. They're going to come out in droves. Local residents will be able to hear the Pope's message from Mexico from across the border. However, they will not be able to see him. Local shops in the area will also be closed. We're going to have the day off, but we're, gonna, we're not going to get paid. 
So, and then the business is going to be closed. Obviously, it's going to affect the business. Police are restricting access to the neighborhood. The only way to get in and out is you're going to have to have a pass, and that is only for the residents that live here. Um, and they're expecting uh, probably thousands of people to jam every nook and cranny that you see in this neighborhood. Sister cities El Paso and Juarez only had nine weeks to plan for the Pope's border visit. There was concern that um, nobody really knows how many people are going to be coming into El Paso, if it's going to be a half million, a hundred thousand, ten thousand, five thousand, nobody really knows. So there was a precaution about those areas being flooded with people wanting to see the Pope or hear him from the American side. Families living in Segundo Barrio will be listening from their backyards. In El Paso, Chloe Norquist, Cronkite News. The U.S. and Cuba signed a deal today that will restore commercial flights to the island for the first time in 50 years. Immediately after the signing, the Department of Transportation opened bidding to American carriers. Up to 110 U.S. Cuba flights could be added per day. Currently, only charters operate between the two countries. The new flights could be added as early as this fall. America's highest court is mourning the loss of Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. Scalia's courtroom chair was draped in black today to mark his death. The Supreme Court tradition dates back to the 19th century. Scalia died Saturday at age 79. He joined the court in 1986 and was its longest serving justice. President Obama says he intends to nominate a successor for Antonin Scalia's seat on the Supreme Court, who is indisputably qualified for the job. Obama also addressed suggestions from Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and others that he should let the next president choose a replacement. There is more than enough time for the Senate to consider in a thoughtful way the record of a nominee that I present. Uh, and to make a decision. The president made his remarks today during a news conference at the conclusion of his summit meetings with leaders of Southeast Asian nations in Rancho Mirage. Protecting the privacy of law-abiding citizens from the government is a pillar of Ted Cruz's Republican presidential candidacy. Associated Press reporter Walter Ratliff explains how his campaign is testing the limits of collecting personal data from supporters. We will stand Liberty. Republican presidential candidate Ted Cruz has made protecting privacy a pillar of his campaign. Imagine a federal government that protected the privacy rights of every American. But the Cruz Crew mobile app is testing the limits of what data is gathered from supporters and how it's used. It asks for real-time GPS location data telling them where their supporters are and it also asks to download the contact list from your phone giving them a trove of con additional contacts. When a poll worker in South Carolina or somewhere like that knocks on a door, they already know not only who lives there, but what appeal specifically to make to the husband or the wife or whoever answers the door based on their predicted psychology. The campaign is then using the data to customize what workers tell potential supporters. Or read nine cases in front of the Supreme Court about religious liberty, um, gun rights, he's one every one of them. Big data in the service of political candidates is nothing new. AP found the Cruz Campaigns app, downloaded to more than 60,000 devices so far, goes furthest in gleaning personal data. Privacy advocates say data collected by campaigns may not be secure. And obviously their biggest concern is to get the vote out, right? Um, which means that they may t cut corners. We've actually we've already seen large breaches this election. There's a history of breaches. Cruz campaign officials say it's different for the government versus a campaign to collect data. The Cruz Crew app does have a privacy policy available and even asks permission before accessing certain data. But it's not known how often users read the privacy policy. Walter Ratliff, The Associated Press.
And the search is on for the next member of the San Diego School Board. Sixteen people have tossed their hats into the ring to fill the seat left vacant when Marnie Foster resigned. The board will review all of the applicants who want to represent San Diego Unified School District E tomorrow. School Board President Michael McQuarrie says even though the appointee will only serve for about nine months, their time on the board can be impactful. Every day matters. Um, this person will be representing their district, they'll be in that community, and if you're a parent and you have a child in that school, every day matters. Macquarie says the board is aiming to swear in the new trustee on February 23rd. Fighting prescription drug abuse in San Diego County, today a group of realtors marked a key milestone of a program that helps get rid of these medications during open houses. Overdose on prescription medications is the leading cause of preventable death in San Diego County. A North County realtor says these drugs are often swiped from medicine cabinets during open houses. Very prominent in our area through the 56 corridor, through Poway High School, Torrey Pines High School, uh, Cathedral Canyon, uh, CCA. Um, so we we feel it. Um, it's it, it really hits home here, and um, I want to make sure my 13-year-old is not affected. The Carmel Valley Group of the North County Association of Realtors partnered with the Safe Homes Coalition at the end of last year, and they have already handed out more than 22,000 bags to real estate clients. Ready to sit back and let go? Silicon Valley companies, along with some of the world's largest automakers, are racing to bring self-driving cars to the market. KQED producer Shiraz Sadiq and reporter Craig Miller explain who is feeling the heart from the heat from the fast pace of developments. Welcome to the future of driving. Cars smart enough to drive themselves. Prototypes of self-driving cars are already on the road in Singapore, Sweden, and here in Silicon Valley. Major automakers such as Mercedes, Audi, and Ford have opened research centers in Silicon Valley to develop technologies that enable cars to sense and interpret the road. Tech giants are also racing to automate automobiles. In September, Apple met with officials at the DMV to discuss autonomous vehicles, adding to reports that it plans to release a self-driving car in a few years. Since 2009, Google has been developing and testing self-driving cars near its offices in Mountain View. This is Google's latest prototype. It's driverless and can go up to 25 miles per hour. They're going with the driverless car concept where you have a removable steering wheel, you may or may not have a rear view mirror, and it's designed to operate at low speeds. A lot of automakers are taking a different approach, which is to have a vehicle in which the human driver drives some of the time and the car drives some of the time. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has developed levels of autonomy. Levels one and two are where one or two functions are automated, like adaptive cruise control and lane keeping. Level three is where the car can, for some period of time, really take the responsibility for driving. And level four is when there's no one responsible for the driving task other than the car itself. You may not be able to buy a level four car until 2025, 20, 2030, but we're gonna start seeing those vehicles come into our lives much sooner than I think a lot of people are anticipating. But UC Berkeley transportation engineer Steven Schladover thinks it'll take decades before cars can safely navigate all the complex situations human drivers encounter. To develop that software to the level that it can be as safe as a skilled human driver or even as an average human driver is a huge challenge. On average, a vehicle will drive 3.3 million hours between fatal crashes or 65,000 hours between injury crashes. Think of what it would take to get a mobile phone that wouldn't have the software fault in millions of hours of operation. But if the computer that's driving the vehicle suffers that failure, somebody could indeed die. Roughly 33,000 people in the U.S. die each year in car accidents. More than 90% of those accidents are due to human error. I have a 15-year-old daughter about to get her license, and I am terrified of, of the thought of her being 
licensed to drive. And, you know, it's not that I don't trust her. What I don't know is how people are going to drive around her. But computers do not get tired. They don't fall asleep. I definitely believe that self-driving cars are going to make our roadways safer. Bernard Soriano is the deputy director of the Department of Motor Vehicles. In 2014, the agency issued rules for testing autonomous cars in California. With the testing regulations, we want to ensure that there's a person, a human being in the vehicle that's capable and qualified to be able to take over control if there's a problem. To get a testing permit, companies must have $5 million worth of insurance to handle any claims arising from accidents. Along with California, Nevada, Michigan, the District of Columbia, and Florida also have regulations for self-driving vehicles, and that can pose a challenge for car makers. When you go from California to Nevada, for example, we have to switch license plates every time we drive over the border, which is kind of not useful. What we'd really like to have is a federal regulation that is the same everywhere. But at the moment, there are no federal safety regulations. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration typically is the one that develops those rules and regulations. They felt it was premature to have regulations around public operation of these vehicles because it's such a new technology. In June, the DMV released data on accidents involving six self-driving cars and standard cars. The self-driving cars were not at fault. And some lawyers think technology may help determine who is to blame when humans and machines share the wheel. While it's being driven by you, I think you would be responsible. Uh, while it's driving itself, then the manufacturer would be responsible. In both the California and the Nevada regulations, every self-driving car has to have what I call a black box, much like the black box in an airplane, which preserves the last 30 seconds prior to any accident. Self-driving vehicles could also make it safer and easier for the disabled and seniors to get around. I am 72 years old and I can't wait for self-driving cars. The thrill of driving a car is, in my teenage years is long past. I want to be driven. And if the thrill of driving is replaced by the thrill of being driven, some may question owning a car at all. You could call up a vehicle on your phone. It'll pick you up drop you immediately to your destination, and carry on helping someone else. So the need to own a car becomes less and less, and without a driver, it can be cheaper and more convenient to share a car than it is to own a car. In the future, your car may even zip along an automated highway with its own license to drive. The Anza Borrego Desert often blossoms this time of year with fields of colorful wildflowers. But this winter's ongoing high temperatures and lack of rainfall have kept the flowers at bay. It takes a perfect combination of frequent light rains and temperatures below 85 degrees for vast fields of desert annuals to bloom. The Anza Borrego Desert's Visitor Center anticipates a couple possible scenarios playing out over the next few weeks. One is that the plants will bloom fairly soon while they're still small in response to the really hot weather. Another possible scenario is that they'll just wither and die. The wildflower outcome depends on future rainfall. The best opportunity to see the wildflowers is by hiking the desert canyons. It may be a Tuesday in February, but the beaches are packed, with several schools out for ski week and temperatures reaching the low 80s through tomorrow. Families are flocking to beaches like Del Mar. Over the three-day weekend, we averaged about 15,000 down here uh, between swimmers and patients on the beach. So that's, uh, that's a good tenfold of a normal, especially a normal Monday in, uh, in February. So it's... Not what we're used to. We're, we're trying to call in all hands here at the beach, guys that work here in the summer to help us out. Winter staffing levels mean several areas have no lifeguard on duty. 
Edelbrook urges beachgoers to pay extra attention to their children and use caution even where ocean conditions appear good. Temperatures were well above average in San Diego County again today. Allison St. John snapped these photos by Oceanside Pier today, where temperatures reached 82 degrees, breaking a record of 78 set in 1977. KPBS weather reporter Steph Davis says tomorrow should feel a whole lot different. Well, we're experiencing record-breaking heat across the San Diego area today. If you've been out and about so far, you've definitely noticed it as temperatures continue to take off. Other than the warm weather, fairly quiet weather pattern in effect for much of the southwestern United States, you'll notice satellite and radar not picking up on a whole lot of precipitation. And that's what we can expect around the San Diego area as well, a persistent ridge of high pressure and control. So we're noticing plenty of bright sunshine and dry weather and that will be the case as we head into tonight. So clear skies on tap for Borrego Springs. Your overnight low is 48 degrees, 38 in Mount Laguna with clear skies. Ramona and Alpine back into the 40s tonight, 48 and quiet in Oceanside. A mild night in store for San Diego with overnight lows back into the mid 50s. Looking ahead to the day tomorrow, still very warm across Southern California and the Four Corners. However, we'll see our Pacific storm system continue to impact the region. It'll reach the San Diego area as we head into Wednesday night. But the bigger story during the day Wednesday are going to be gusty winds. The National Weather Service has put a wind advisory in effect for the mountains and the deserts starting Wednesday morning and lasting throughout your Thursday evening. We're looking at wind gusts between 55 and 65 miles per hour. So definitely want to exercise caution if you're heading out and about. Your five day outlook for the coast looks like this partly sunny, warm, and windy on Wednesday. Wednesday Wednesday night into Thursday, we see that Pacific moisture arrive with, with an increase in clouds and showers, and that wet weather is going to cool things back off into the upper 60s Friday and Saturday. Mostly sunny and beautiful as we look ahead to Sunday with highs in the low 70s. Here's a look at your five day outlook for inland. We have fog lifting for sunshine Wednesday with highs in the low 70s, that wet weather arriving Wednesday night and into Thursday with a couple of clouds and showers around. Temperatures much more seasonable Friday and Saturday, and then we'll climb to a high of 72 as we look ahead to Sunday. Your five day outlook for the mountains show a similar weather pattern, partly sunny and warm Wednesday, high 64. Spotty showers arriving during the day Thursday, partial sunshine and cooler on Friday, and then temperatures rebound back into the mid 60s as we look ahead to the day on Sunday. Five day outlook for the desert sure is warm out there for your Wednesday daytime high 87 degrees, not as warm but comfortable for Thursday, and then a quiet and pleasant pleasant weather pattern Friday through the weekend with plenty of bright sunshine and comfortably mild temperatures. Steph Davis, KPBS News. It's the largest single location collaborative workspace in the country for tech geeks. In this SciTech report, Chris Jewell takes us inside geekdom. They're throwing a party in San Antonio. Fiestas are common here, but this one is different. It's for the tech community, affectionately known as geeks. Today at the fourth anniversary of Geekdom, we're at this incredible party with a thousand people here. It's just amazing. It's a dream come true. It's a carnival. Like, so, so what matches geeks more than a sideshow? Because if you take carnies and geeks and some people walking off the street, it's about the same thing, except like maybe they don't have a laptop, but it's about the same, same characters. Nick and I were hoping that Geekdom would spark the tech community, and it really has. Geekdom is a new kind of collaborative co-working space uh, where entrepreneurs and technologists, creatives can get together and build awesome things together. Geekdom is home to hundreds of techies, entrepreneurs, and startup companies, including the Techstars Cloud. Techstars is essentially a global ecosystem that helps entrepreneurs bring new technologies to market. Entrepreneurs from all over the world will come to this program to get access to the mentorship that we have here and the resources for cloud technologies. In addition to the companies that come to San Antonio to participate in the program, we've also got a worldwide network of investors and mentors that are experts or interested in the cloud field when they come to San Antonio to mentor the teams, to look at potential investment opportunities, and to help these companies get started. 
you don't have to be just a company to get an office. You can be one person and say, I want to get an office at Geekdom. Well, what we do is we team you up with three other people in that office. And what we do our best at, I think, is to make sure they're not the same as you. So if you're a developer, we want to put you in with a creative, okay? And then maybe some type of numbers type person. By the time you're done talking in three or four days, you might come up with a new idea. And then all of a sudden, they're launching another company. It was kind of uh, uh, almost an arranged blind date, if you will, from the Geekdom community putting us together. Geekdom paired entrepreneur Andrew Trickett with technology developer Franklin Lyons, and the two launched a startup called Merge VR, which now manufactures virtual reality goggles and software for the consumer market. I feel like I'm a part of this artificial world, like I'm actually inside of the scene. And as I look around, you know, I, I feel like I'm actually inside of this world. Okay. All right, here we go. We can use it as a, what's called an empathy machine because it really extracts emotions. It isn't just something that's for fun, it's that you can actually almost literally step inside of someone else's shoes and be them for a little while. It's like, what's it really like to be someone in a different part of the world, in a different culture, living in a different environment? Maybe make the world a little bit better place to live as a result. They don't know that their tribe is that close to them. So creating a hub where everyone can get together that's where the magic happens, right? And at the end of the day, I think of it as um, where we all needed and wanted to be from the beginning. And just opening it up to everyone, it just made it perfect for us. I think that we've seen such an evolution of the tech community. There's so many more startups, so many more developers participating, so many entrepreneurs coming out of the woodwork. Um, I think it's, you know, the sky's the limit. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us. Have a great evening.